Welcome, Nolan, Bitcoiner, another episode of The Breakup, a show where we look at the relationships that go into money, our relationship with money, the relationships we use to make dollars, the relationships we use to make Bitcoin, and we contrast those relationships, we contrast the psychology of it, the psychology engine that is our economy, the thing that makes it push forward, and we measure that momentum of the dollar and the momentum of Bitcoin as it relates to the choices we all make to build the future, right? So this show really takes the frame of a relationship that we have with money and says, well, some relationships have to, have to end. So it's not about trading dollars for Bitcoin. In the end, I like to describe the show just so people understand. It's that moment when you're having a conversation with someone who maybe owns some Bitcoin, is into stuff, and they say to you, when are you going to sell to a Bitcoiner? And then you look at that person and you say, what are you talking about? What? That disconnect is what I think this show is about. That disconnect is what this show is about. And, and so it's all about the relationships we have and psychology. The relationship I want to talk about today is a really important one. It's what brought me into Bitcoin, actually. Uh, one of the first sort of failure uh, institutions the governments around the world had created. And that failure is even worse today. I mean, so bad. We have not done anything to measure the cost benefit of some of the the government institutions we use, some of the regulatory institutions we use, and FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, is one of the worst in the world. One of the worst. And and there's a fun simulation tie-in today. We always like coincidences. Remember we, a couple of days on the show we talked about synchronicity and coincidences. So I said today, I want to do it on Hong Kong because Hong Kong stands out for me as the greatest example of the cost of FATF, the global compliance regime for cryptocurrencies, for banking, for all financial transactions. Um, so my history in Bitcoin really began with the Senate Banking Committee in Canada, where I looked at high level studies. My first one out of law school was the financial crisis, how Canada wasn't really affected the same way as the United States, but we learned a lot about the financial crisis of 08 in general. The next one I did was on the FATF rule, the travel rule, and, and the amount of information that goes along with it. The travel rule, you know, you, you kind of know a bit about it. It's not exactly the one the banks have to do, but you know when you travel between countries and you sign a $10,000 declaration about cash on you and you say, yes, I have 10000 in cash, I declare it at the border, or I don't? That's a big part of the travel rule of FATF, right, on individuals. But they make banks do it for transactions above $1,000. So what happened was in 2011, most of this regime came about as a result of 9-11. In 2011, a little more than 10 years ago and a little more than 10 years after it was created, our job in the Senate Banking Committee was to have a look at this. Now, United States federalism and Canadian federalism are almost exact copies, except for one exception. It's banking. Banking's federal. The states, the provinces in Canada, still have the ability to license co-ops. Now, the co-ops can't corporatize compliance with FATF. They can't corporatize those $10,000 declarations. So, for many reasons, but the point is the, the, the kind of business model they're allowed to regulate from a state level in Canada for banking is really only good for local areas that can't push all of the compliance like a federal bank can to Toronto or the capital. So it's the same as a company in the United States having a head office in New York, and you can push a lot of compliance to the head office in New York, and the local branches don't have to deal with it. They can't do that in Canada for the co-ops. The co-ops need their own loan officers, their own compliance officers. They can't share the reserves of each of these and, and the, the corporate responsibilities of each of these entities. So it's a, it's a minor detail, not that important. What I found interesting at the time when we were looking at it 10 years ago is that this was pretty good politically. So that's how I kind of got the, the opening to do it because we had as I looked into it, this international organization, FATF, creating rules for everybody around the world that all, this is the way it works. You've got FATF, Financial Action Task Force, right? And then you've got FinCEN in the United States. We've got FinTrack in Canada. It could be the HKMA in Hong Kong. Uh, but it's, it's the, the, the local entity that ends up enforcing FATF policies. So what we saw was this international organization in Paris that was telling local rural co-ops how to hire people because they were telling us in, in, in their efforts that instead of hiring loan officers to give loans for local businesses, they were hiring more compliance officers and, and that was unacceptable. So we liked the look of that politically. However, when I started to uncover what FATF was actually doing, 
I got a bipartisan committee of senators, liberals, Democrats, that's Republicans, Dem uh, sorry, liberals, conservatives, that's Republicans, Democrats for, for American translation. And both of them agreed that the regime was terrible. Why? We found out that for all the copious amounts of information they were gathering on Canadians, just constant, every transaction, right? Who is it? What's your bank account name, number? What, you know, who are you? Da, 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 all the information that goes along with every transaction, the travel rule, the information that has to travel with the money. Um, they were not prosecuting anyone, nobody. They got no prosecutions, right? So they got almost nothing from this entire regime. Now, let me repeat that. This entire regime that we were contemplating changing the rules for and everyone, it's so complicated. What were we ever getting from it? Nothing. We were not prosecuting anyone. So I got both groups of senators to get furious, right? Like as if these guys were telling us they had solved money laundering because there were no prosecutions, uh, yet they needed to tweak the rules of it. So in the end, the committee gave them nothing. It was a disaster for Finn Track in Canada. They, they really were stunted, the privacy commissioner had a lot to uh, to say about what they were up to and we had a lot of allies and in the end the the story was an, a bipartisan let's say uh, criticism of fatif now this was 2012 when we were when we finally tabled the report it was my intro to bitcoin because i learned about bitcoin on that study and i got our Senate committees do, and, and because everyone's mind was open, all the senators' minds were open with, with the disaster of FATF and FinTrack and FinCEN and all these guys, their minds were open to the future and that you couldn't necessarily deputize the entire banking sector to do the job of the police and compliance and all that stuff. They recognized that reality. So when we heard about Bitcoin, I started pushing it and promoting it as a thing we need to study and focus on for a whole year. We did that. You had Andreas Antonopoulos' speech that we brought him to the Senate committee to do it. We even hashed the report into Bitcoin's blockchain using the Opraturn script, I think block 36425 or something around there. Uh, and we got the Senate committee, so tabled it in Parliament simultaneous to hashing in um, the Senate's conclusion, Satoshi's invention deserves a light regulatory touch. So that's in that Bitcoin blockchain. Go have a look. Uh, I haven't seen it in a while, but uh, it's been there. I've cited it many times. So I quit my job right there and and then have been working in Bitcoin ever since. But the issue of Hong Kong and the travel rule never kind of left me. I was lucky enough to visit Hong Kong in 2016 and got to meet all the early Bitcoin community there and miss it dearly. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. It's such an amazing place, so much energy, so so unique on planet Earth. But here's what's going on with Hong Kong today. And this is where we're tying into the news and, and, and talking about why it's time to break up with a lot of these institutions. So, and here's a great thing. We talked about the simulation of the day and synchronicity. Here's a fun thing. So I knew I was talking about Hong Kong today. I knew I was gonna talk about Hong Kong today with the travel rule and, and all that, because we're talking about the cost benefit of FATF, this international organization. What does it cost? So it's been my mind for a long time that it cost us Hong Kong. And I'll explain in a second. So. When I, when I looked at this synchronicity thing today, I said, well, I'm gonna do it on Hong Kong. Let me see what's in the news about Hong Kong. There's plenty. It's Hong Kong's birthday today, right? It's Hong Kong's birthday. It's 181 years old. 181 years ago, with the first opium war, the British were given Hong Kong Island as a, you know, that, that, that's how they signed the peace deal. A lot of people in Beijing thought the British were gonna take an island outside of Shanghai. And they actually laughed at at the, the really Scottish people who, who, were, who were doing this back then. They said, why didn't you take this beautiful land? It's fertile, you can grow things on it, you, you have water. But of course, everyone there realized any army could come on that land and take it over very quickly. But all those navigators on all those ships understood that the bay in Hong Kong was one of the greatest natural ports on earth, as good as New York Harbor you could have fleets of boats in there. And if you see it, it's just this huge bay protected by Victoria Island, which is a steep mountain. And now, and there's no running water, you can't farm it. There's or very little water for a city, but what they knew was they could defend it, right? You could go to the top of that mountain and shoot anyone coming down. So that became British soil. And, and it wasn't just a, a thing that they had you know, leased or anything. The Kowloon and the lease and everything was lit far later. The actual island became British soil and that was really important because there was no more extradition. It was British soil and common law applied. What happened was China had been in a, in a, let's say malaise for a few hundred years, the empire was crumbling and rotten, but they had so much control, the Manchurian 
government had so much control that they were rooting out all revolutionaries. It turned out that the revolutionaries were able to use Hong Kong because they could go there and plot the revolution, which ended up totally changing China. And to this day, when you think back into these late 1800 time frame, most Chinese immigration that we know of in the West actually came from there. They were all from Canton. That's the Canton region. And they were using the Hong Kong window to get out and, and come to America, come all over the world. So most people's impression of China in that time was from Canton. The rest, the West did not have access to and they could not leave. But that part did. And that part was really part of the destabilizing force, which ended up ending the imperial rule and bringing about change, which leads us to where we are today. So that's just one story. Right? It's the birthday today. We've got this history piece, really important. So extradition was a huge thing. Remember that. A couple other stories in the news today about Hong Kong that I thought were amazing. Um, you've got Vice, which is published an article today about the entire independent news scene over in Hong Kong, everyone losing their job, all the things going out of business, everything that's been around there for years that would fight against Chinese, um, you know, politics, all out of business. And they interviewed these guys, they're all, you know, Uber drivers now and, and chicken fry chefs. So go read that today. Reuters also had a story, right? So here's the simulation. So there's no journalism, um, you know, uh, 181st birthday today. And finally, Reuters published a story today saying that Hong Kong will probably not open till 2024, 2024. So Hong Kong, already almost impossible to get in. It's like a month quarantine or something in or out, right? This is just gonna lead to a huge exodus again. So what ended up happening here? How did Hong Kong find itself in this state? Well, let's go back to FATF, right? Let's go back to FATF. In 2019, the way FATF works is it's an international organization set up in Paris. The member countries, right? The member countries um, take a turn at the presidency every year. They get a one year turn. In 2019, in June, it was China's turn. So China took its place at the head of FATF. And that means they can start publishing stuff. So the way it all works is you've got FinCEN, HKMA, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Banks give them information. Exchanges give them information on their customers. Law enforcement looks up that database and then theoretically they get prosecutions. As I mentioned, there are no prosecutions. They don't actually do that almost anywhere in the world. I looked the Treasury Department in the United States through FinCEN ends up giving like some rewards to some people who do some stuff. It's hardly anything, really small amounts. Um, so very, you know, for the amount of information they're gathering, not a lot of return on an investment, if you will, as far as prosecuting. It's, it's as if, according to them, there is no money laundering, right? It's as if because of the amount they're catching versus what they say they're catching. It's just not happening. So FATF, what it does is it names and shames countries, right? That's its power. It's, it's a naming and they're very proud about this. They're a name and shame system, right? So China takes over in June 2019. China takes over FATF. And the first thing they do is name and shame Hong Kong. What was it that Hong Kong did wrong? What Hong Kong was missing, according to them, according to the Chinese controlled FATF of 2019, what Hong Kong was missing was extradition to mainland China. Now, remember what I said about the history of China? That idea of going to Hong Kong and having common law apply to you, habeas corpus, we say, right? You can't take possession of a human body and put it in a prison without due process. It's sort of the, the, the basic tenets of common law, right? One of the most important primordial symbols of the entire system, right? Habeas corpus, your body is the sanct sanctity of your individual body before the law, especially when it comes to um, prison, right? You can do it according to these rules as one of the most important social contracts we have. And, and in the end, what they said in Hong Kong was, because they don't have extradition for financial crimes to China, it's a major problem. So the mayor of Hong Kong that summer, Carrie Lam, cited the FATF report regularly to say we need extradition to mainland China. That's what caused the huge uprising and protests and riots in the summer of 2019 in Hong Kong. It was all about extradition. It was all about FATF, right? It was all about FATF. In the end, what happens is, as far as I'm concerned, and anyone can prove me wrong or argue it, but what I see happening is, in order to comply with FATF, the Western world gave up Hong Kong. That's it. There's no other way to see it, as far as I can tell, right? We had a system that names and shames countries, 
China took control of that system, named and shamed Hong Kong under FATF. It was the FATF provisions of extradition that mattered. Now, the problem you say, oh, extradition. Well, what does that mean? What it means is Chinese law applies to Hong Kong nationals. It's no longer common law. It's no longer the British legal system. They can get extradited where the Chinese law will apply to them. Right. So the minute they leave the island of Hong Kong or the area of Hong Kong and they go to mainland China, then the Chinese law applies to them. So the extradition is really the important part. It's everything. Right. It's extradition means you, the, the common law of Hong Kong is optional. You just extradite them to, Hong, to mainland China and get your way. Right. So Carrie Lam cited this. The American government at the time, for all this mischief on her part, actually uh, sanctioned her. Right. She, she lost all access to her American bank accounts and all that stuff. So, so this was a major thing that happened. Now, we were okay, our institutions were okay with the FATF part. We just didn't like that she was kind of rude or whatever. Who knows why they sanctioned her, right? Probably other things, probably trade war things, probably other things that don't really matter. No one actually checked her on the extradition piece, right? No one said, well, the FATF thing is no good. Uh, therefore, you should get over this extradition piece. That was never said out loud by anybody, right? No other government said, hey, wait a minute here. Are we giving up a crown jewel of the common law legal jurisdictions in the world? Are we giving up this unbelievable pressure valve that has grown next to China in order to integrate China with the West and the West with China? That, that's what Hong Kong was. It was this financial portal and, and, and really freedom and democracy portal at the same time. And, and now that's gone. There's no such thing anymore. Hong Kong's dead, right? So happy birthday, Hong Kong. You're fucking dead. Right? You're not anything anymore. One of the greatest cities in the world was sacrificed for FATF compliance. It's unbelievable that we would sacrifice. Imagine sacrificing New York City because of some bureaucrat in, in Paris not being happy with something that's going on. That's what happened. Right? That's what happened. We sacrificed a, a beacon of light in the world in order to appease a few international bureaucrats. And that's where the, the real tough stuff starts. So, you know, if your mindset is, oh, we live in a democracy and, and I love democracy and it's great. And we live in the West and our dem democracies are so great. Well, wake up. No, 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 no. The West didn't stand up for itself in this instance, right? It allowed the bureaucrats to, to, to get their way. What you have here is actual sovereign nations being subjugated, subordinate, to this thing. And what do we get from it? What's the benefit? It's not much. The cost is unbelievable. The cost is Hong Kong. The benefit, I don't know. So I guess some people get to pat themselves on the back and say the regime is intact. We have uh, some form of anti-money laundering provisions in the world. Great. So you've deputized the entire banking system and they're not even getting the job done. And if that's not enough, we're going to sacrifice countries in order to get this thing done. Right? That's what we did. So that's why we call this show The Breakup. Right? There's no negotiating with these people. There's no, uh, oh, if FATF just, let's go have a hearing and say to FATF, oh, they're going to go. No, you, you, you got to fight them. you got to fight them at every level. Right? They're useless. They don't do anything. They cost us Hong Kong. They cost us Hong Kong. Right? Don't let it happen again. Don't let it happen to another city. Right? We've got to fight against FATF. Cancer. That's the show for today, guys. i got to travel. Um, and I gotta send all this stupid data all around the world, all these idiot apps now, and and it could be fat off all over again. Right? They could be saying that if countries don't do this stuff, then then they're out of the club too. So that's where we're at. Gotta break up with it. All right, everyone. Thanks a lot. See you next time.